Last uh, time together, we were considering the 139th Psalm. You remember, we spent uh, most of our time on the previous Psalm, but we had some time left, so we began our consideration of Psalm 139. And this is a Psalm about our great God and the greatness of our great God. In order for a being to be deity, he must have certain attributes. He must be certain things in essence. And some of those things are uh, a divine being, to be God, he must be uh, omniscient. He must know everything. He must be omnipresent. He must be everywhere at one and the same time. He must also be omnipotent. He, may, he must be able to do anything. And that sets him apart uh, from a creature. The creator is the creator because he is all of these things. Now, he has other attributes also, other necessary attributes, for instance, to be deity. One must be eternal, for uh, it's not possible to create deity. So he must have always been, and he must always be. If he uh, does not possess that quality, then he, he is not deity. And this is why it's so foolish for idols to be referred to as God. They are not omnipotent. They are not omniscient. Uh, they are not omnipresent. Neither are they eternal. And Satan, who would be as God, is none of these. And man, who would at times attempt to make himself God, is none of these. But this psalm is about such a one. And uh, it's about such a one as he has to do with me. And we pointed out before that the 139th Psalm has been labeled by some God and me. And I suppose in its simplest uh, title, uh, a simple title for it would be just that. The first six verses have to do with uh, God's omniscience as it has to do with me personally. And so it's a very personal psalm. And we considered these uh, first six verses uh, last week, but let's go over the, them again. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. See, this is uh, omniscient. So you'll see the frequent use of the word know. Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and my uprising, thou understandest my thought afar, my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. We pointed out last week that this has to do with his knowledge concerning my thoughts, my walk, my ways, and my words. For uh, this word, path, in the third verse, uh, is could be very easily translated my walking and uh, the word compasses there in the third verse uh, has the thought of winnowing like wheat is winnowed so thou winnowest my walking and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways and there is not a word in my tongue, lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. But lo, thou knowest it altogether. And the thought here is that God knows the word while it's still a thought. A word must be a thought before it can be a word. And the poetic uh, reference here is that at a time when it's still in my tongue, before my tongue has released it, God knows it. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. This thou hast beset me doesn't mean he's setting a snare for me. 
but he is there all around all the time. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot attain unto it. Seems as though there's a there's a verse in the New Testament that would bear on this uh, in Romans chapter 11, is it? Let me look and see. It just crossed my mind. Romans 11.33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? This would be the same thought as we have here in the sixth verse. Such knowledge is too wonderful or too awesome for me. It's high. I cannot attain unto it. I can't grasp. Uh, in, its, in, its, in its entirety. Then, uh, beginning with the seventh verse, and extending through the twelfth, the second, sixth verse passage, we have the omnipresence of God and me. For he says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? By the way, in the scriptures, all three personages of, uh, of the Godhead are ascribed these characteristics. The Son is said to be omnipresent. He said himself, I am with you always. That means with all of us always to the end of the age. And uh, we pointed out Last week, uh, in, uh, in John chapter 2, it said that he knew all, or all people, everything on everybody's mind. So, um, omniscience is ascribed to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's one way we can know that there are three personages, all equally God. One God, three persons in manifestation. And uh, so here we have, whither shall I go from thy spirit? These same attributes are ascribed to God the Holy Spirit. Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in jail, the grave that is, thou art there. Behold, thou there, I, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Now this, uh, verse 9, is a poetic way of saying, if I go east or if I go west. You see, if I take the wings of the morning, that's uh, towards the east, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, that's the west, because the sea was west from where the psalmist lived, the great sea which was the sea in his time. So he says, if I go ever so far to the east, or if I go ever so far to the west, and when God wants to uh, speak of uh, infinity, uh, as far as uh, the, uh, the, the directions are concerned, he always uses east and west, rather than north and south. Uh, we found this, uh, if you remember, in uh, which Psalm was? 103, remember? Uh, he has removed my sins as far as the east is from the west in, in Psalm 103. Um, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. And we pointed out when we were considering that psalm that it would not have been appropriate to say as far as the north is from the south because that's, an, that's a finite distance. You can measure the distance from north to south. For if you go so far north, 
And if you keep going, you'll be going south. And if you go so far south, and you keep going, you'll be going north. So there's a time when south ends, and there's a time when north ends. But there is no time when east ends, or when west ends. East is infinite. West is infinite. And so when God wants to speak of infinity in distance, he uses east and west rather than north and south. Just, uh, you know, it, it kind of, it kind of makes a little, uh, uh, tinge of, of, uh, anger or something rise up in me when I hear, it, and it's often said, the Bible is not a science book. Well, I think the Bible is a science book. Uh, whether we use the word science in, in, uh, etymolo etymologically, or how you say that, uh, uh, unless we're speaking of the etymology of the word, how's that? Uh, or what it means in its, uh, distinctiveness, or whether we're speaking of, uh, of how we've come to use the word. Uh, the word science is knowledge. You see the, uh, just think of the word omniscience. It's got science right in it, hasn't it? That, that comes from two Latin words that simply means all knowledge. Omniscience means all knowledge. And, uh, so science is knowledge. And who can say otherwise than that the Bible is a book of knowledge? But, when it speaks on those matters which we call science, it's so scientifically accurate. And uh, it, it's a matter of fact, you, you have science in the first word. Uh, I mean, science is we, we speak of it when we speak of the subject of science. Uh, in the first verse, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Why, you have time, infinity, force, space, and matter. All there in one verse, don't you? In the beginning, that's time. God, that's infinity. Created, that's force. The heavens, that's space. And the earth, that's matter. So, uh, you got all kinds of science. From one end of the, the Bible to the other. So here we have poetic, uh, science poetically presented. In verse 9, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, or dwell, we could say. You'll notice the conjunction there has been added by the translator. Verse 10, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. In other words, as far as God and I are concerned, it makes no difference, dark or night. Man thinks it does. He thinks night hides his action. Uh, in the insurance business, uh, sometimes uh, our client will want some burglary insurance. And you'll say, the only way that we'll sell you any burglary insurance is if you'll have the city of Lakeland come out and put some uh, light poles around and let the lights burn all night. Well, uh, that's expensive these days, but we're not interested in insuring them unless they'll do that, because burglars tend to like the darkness rather than the light, because they're hiding from men, not from God, at least uh, they evidently don't think about God. But uh, with God, it makes no difference. He sees Regardless, and that's what the psalmist says, says here. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. <laughs> this, this is too wonderful for me, the psalmist says. Uh, I can speak about it, but I can't get the full comprehension of it. So we have the first six verses, God's omniscience in me. The next six verses, God's omnipresent and me. And then in the next four verses, verses 13 through 16, God's omnipotence 
and me. When we think of the word omnipotence, it's a rather grand word. We might even say grandiose word, if that doesn't give the wrong connotation. But uh, omnipotence has to do with very small things, too. Omnipotence has to do with atoms, you know, molecules and things like that, little intricate things. Uh, we don't uh, conjure up in our mind thoughts of those little intricacies. When we speak of omnipotence, we think of, of great things. But uh, omnipotence, all potent, all powerfulness, means the power to do the smallest as well as the greatest. And the... Uh, the psalmist brings this out in regards to his own self. For thou hast possessed my reins, that means my innermost being. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. See, he, this is omnipotence in relationship to me. That's a marvelous thing. Uh, we pointed out, I believe it was last week, how Job knew that he would be raised from the dead. He says, I know that even though worms eat this flesh, that someday I'll stand before my God in bodily form. In the flesh I shall see my God. And he says, the reason I know that is because God shall have a desire for his handiwork. He knew God well enough to know that God didn't make something as detailed as a human body. And so, so uh, uh, to be marveled at as a human body just for us, for not. And that's why it's such a, such a hideous sin to fail to receive Christ and be saved is because a, a person's body is a great handiwork of the Creator, and God has a right to have his handiwork. And when we will not come to God his way in repentance, we deny him the joy of his own handiwork. And that's a hideous sin. For God is holy, and uh, he cannot receive us in our sin. And so if we insist on dying in our sin, then we rob God Almighty of his own handiwork. You know, it's amazing how far apart is our idea of sins of magnitude in God's idea. And I suppose the Psalms bring this out certainly as vividly as any part of the, the Bible. Because uh, David, for instance, commit, uh, commits about the two most heinous sins as far as we would, would be concerned, adultery and then murder. And then he prays, God, oh, keep me from the great transgression. He says, uh, God, uh, I've sinned this way and this way, but don't let me sin the great transgression. Well, we'll say, well, David, look, fella, uh, look what you've done. And you're worried about committing the great transgression. Well, what is the great transgression? The great, great transgression is presumption, the sin of presumption, presuming against the great God and under the Old Testament sacrificial system. There was no sacrifice for that sin. You can read about it in Numbers chapter 15. There you'll find uh, God's provision for sins of ignorance and sins of error. That is, the committing of sins that I didn't know were sin, or the committing of sins which my lust drew me into. But for the presumptuous sin, there was no sacrifice. 
And uh, that's what David, if you want to read that, it's in Psalm 19, about, uh, I suppose, verses 11, 12, such as that, where he prays to keep him from the, from the great transgression. And then you remember, wasn't it Psalm 36? The transgression of the wicked saith in his heart, there's no fear of God before his eyes. The great transgression is to disregard God and presume that I can stand before a God on my own merit. This is the great sin. And God puts sin in its uh, proper perspective, and we don't get that perspective except through the word of God. Back to our psalm, verse 14, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. And he's speaking now of his own body when he's speaking of God's work, that which was wrought within his mother's womb. He says, it's fearful, wonderful, marvelous. And he says, my soul, no, I know this from my innermost being. Nobody had to teach me. Verse 15, my substance was not hidden from thee when I was made in secret and curiously. This word that's translated curiously is a word that's used in weaving when uh, it spoke of the very intricate work in the high priestly robe or in the veil. It said that they were curiously woven. It means with great intricacy they were woven. So it, it, that, that's what it means here. Wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. In other words, with a God that's so high down here where we live, he does an intricate work that can be only described as wonderful and marvelous. And uh, we can see what a terrible sin it is, for instance, uh, to commit abortion and bring to an end the handiwork of God. There he is doing an awe-inspiring work of wonder in his own way, and man would presume to bring to a halt that which God is doing. And uh, I suppose there's a lot of argument nowadays whether uh, that action is, uh, is murder or whether it isn't. Uh, that really is beside the point. It's the attitude of heart that would just barge in and stop something that God is doing. It's that attitude of heart that's the gross sin. That's the great transgression. Not, uh, we try to say, we try to, uh, you know, argue, well, the fact that it's murder makes it a bad sin. But that's not the crux of the point. It would man presume to stop the hand of God. You say, well, why does God permit such a thing? I don't believe I, I will explain that. But God certainly has given man a lot of leeway, hasn't he? Well, There are two different words, obviously. Uh, I don't suppose we could divorce the two completely, presumption and rejection. Uh, presumption uh, leads to the rejection of God's Son uh, as our Savior. To presume upon God 
is to have this attitude. Well, certainly this is wrong, but God's the God of love and he is merciful, so he'll forgive me no matter what I do. That would be an example of presumption. In the New Testament, it's called willful sin. If we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a fearful looking forward of the fiery indignation that shall devour the adversary. That's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, maybe 27. There it's speaking of willful sin on the part of a Christian that would receive salvation and then presume upon God's mercy. Well, uh, that's, uh, sometimes I, I teach a Bible lesson called willful sin. And, uh, but it takes me, uh, two hours and, uh, to lay the foundation or it doesn't come out right. Because it's, uh, it's a, a subject of, uh, of great breadth in the Bible. Willful sin. It's called presumptuous sin in the Old Testament. Willful sin in the New Testament. Same thing. Uh, Presumptuous sin can be committed by a saved or an unsaved person. A saved person can presume upon God. So uh, it doesn't really define whether someone has rejected Christ as their Savior or not. One who received Christ as their Savior can then later uh, presume upon God's mercy. You know, one time I said that and I didn't explain it any further. And the next thing I knew, someone had said, well, the problem with Don Kelso, he's weak on eternal security. But uh, I'm not speaking of eternal security. And just so nobody uh, misunderstands, <laughs> I better say it right here. If whatsoever God doeth, it is forever. And God doeth it that man should fear before him. Nothing can be put to it. And nothing can be taken from it. So if God saves, it's forever. And I don't know how you can be saved if God doesn't save. The Bible says, whatsoever God doeth, it is forever. Nothing can be put to it. Nothing can be taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. Ecclesiastes 3.14, I believe. So, uh, I'm not light on eternal security. If anybody saved by God, he's saved. Now, if you've got something you call salvation and God didn't do it, I can't vouch for that. But if God did it, it's forever. Sorry, Jim, that's about as far as I'm going to go on that subject right now. Verse 16, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect or not completely formed, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. In other words, God knew exactly what my hand would be like before it was a hand, and what my eye would be like before it would see, and he made it all. And this is omnipotent. It's eight, it's ability to do what God will do. Now, beginning with verse 17 and extending through the rest of the psalm, God is going to talk about his thoughts and my thoughts. But the psalmist puts it in his perspective. 
In other words, the subject is going to be God's thought and my thought. But it, it's being looked at from the uh, perspective of the psalmist. He says first, how wonder all, wonder, or how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. Now two things are said here about the thoughts of God. Number one, that they are precious. In the New Testament we're told that in Christ Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. A treasure is something precious, and God's thoughts are a hidden treasure. Now, they are a hidden treasure that can be found, because you remember we read in Romans chapter 11, who can know the mind of God? But the Apostle Paul says, we now have the mind of Christ. We know all, he says. That is to say, we have the very omniscient Spirit of God within us. And whatever we need to know, God can impart to the yielded one. Knowledge, all knowledge is uh, the fountain from which we drink. And the only reason we're not omniscient is because our container won't hold all of the water of the fountain in God's will. But we drink from the fountain of omniscience. So he says, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God, how great is the sum of them. We're told here that his thoughts are precious, and we're told that his thoughts are many. And we found this subject of God's thoughts throughout the Psalms, haven't we? We found out, for instance, in another Psalm, that God's thoughts are usward. The psalmist said, he thinks upon me. Now, isn't that a marvel? God thinks upon me. Remember what psalm that was in? Was it Psalm 40? That's See, in Psalm 40, verse 5, Many, O Lord God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts are usward. And then to put it personally, he says in verse 17 of Psalm 40, But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. His thoughts are precious, his thoughts are many, his thoughts are usward, and he thinks upon me. And another psalm says his thoughts are very deep, or very profound. And another place we're told that his thoughts are very high. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. So his thoughts are many. His thoughts are precious. His thoughts are deep. His thoughts are high. And glory to God, his thoughts are towards me. He thinketh upon me. And that's what this psalm is about. He thinketh upon me. But this section from 17 to 24 is not only about God's thought, but it's about my thought towards God. God warns us back in the 10th Psalm that it's not man's nature to think upon God. It's God's nature to think upon man. In verse 18, if I should count them, that is God's thought, they are more in number than the sand when I awake, I am still with thee. Perhaps we could see the resurrection here. When I awake, I am still with thee. 
The psalmist may be speaking of no more than than his uh, awake awaking from slumber, from the night's rest. But uh, this term is used in the Bible, when I awake. Can you think of the, where is it, in Psalm 16 or 17? Yes, in Psalm 17, the last verse, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. That's Psalm uh, 17, verse 15, and this is speaking of the resurrection, when I awake. So, uh, when I awake, I am still with thee, the one that thinketh upon me. Then the psalmist is attempting to think in God's channel of thought concerning the wicked. How does God think towards the wicked? Well, the psalmist says, Every day he is angry with the wicked. Well, the psalmist says, if God in his thoughts is angry with the wicked, I want to be angry with the wicked. So he says, verse 19, Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God, depart from me, therefore ye bloody men, for they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. He says, the reason it's all right for me to think this way about wickedness is because the wicked speak against God because the wicked take his name in vain. You know, I remember one time I was walking along the street. It happened to be in Tampa. And uh, there were three great big fellows walking right in front of me. They had the sidewalk kind of blocked, and they weren't going very fast. And so I walked up right behind them. And uh, they were just, they were just cursing. I mean, they were taking the Lord's name in vain, something awful. And I should have had better sense, but I just felt compelled to say something. And uh, I said, pardon me a moment. And you know, they came up short. And I said, you should not take the name of the Lord God in vain. He's your creator, and you're cursing him. And you'll have to face that one day, face to face. And they just stood there. And one of them says, uh, Oh, wish I. And then they walked on away. But I, I just, I just felt like, I just didn't, felt impelled. I had to do this. Now, I don't know, I, I've heard people curse God a lot of times, and I, I don't do that always. Uh, maybe I should, but I, I certainly felt impelled that time. And I don't know what good it might have done, but they didn't take offense. And they were very meek about it, turned around, excused themselves, and walked off. But uh, he says that, uh, Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God, depart from me, therefore ye bloody men, for they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee, and am not I grieved with those who rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them as my enemies. I suppose, uh, in the light of the teaching that we should love our enemies, but all the while, it's all right to hate their attitude against God when the holiness of God is the question. As long as we're certain what we're hating in them. And the psalmist can say, I 
hate them with a perfect hatred. What is this perfect hatred? That he's grieved with those who rise up against God. And those that hate God, there is a, there is a proper hatred. Uh, our normal type of hatred is an improper hatred. You say, but God wants us to love such. What he wants us to love, he wants us to love the fact that they are God's creatures and that because they're God's creatures, God has loved them and provided a way to himself. And we love what they can be in Christ, if they will. I realize this is is difficult, but the difficulty is not with the psalm. The difficulty is with our ability to understand God's thinking towards love and hate. And this is the only real difficulty here. Now that the psalmist is going to uh, talk about his thoughts. He talked about God's thoughts. Now he says in verse 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. I suppose I've said a number of times that I use these two verses in my own life more than any other verses in the Bible. I don't say that they're my favorite verses, necessarily. I suppose I must have many of those. But I know that I use these more. Because they're the only defense I know against what God says my heart is like. And if I want to be particularly brutal with my own nature, I start out by reading Jeremiah chapter 17 first, or a portion of Jeremiah, chapter 17, where it says, the heart, this is in verse 9 of Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. I, the Lord, search the heart. And what I do, I insert the little word my in place of the word the. My heart, my own heart, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And the answer is the Lord searches the heart. The Lord searches the heart. So, if that's the type of heart I have, then I'm in a good position to say, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me. And know my thoughts. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. You know, the Apostle Paul comments on a situation. It's back in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And he was writing about the fact that he was being judged by some of the folks in Corinthian, in Corinth. You'll remember that he had spent some 18 months in Corinth, and then he had gone on to Jerusalem. And when he got to Jerusalem, he found that the saints in Jerusalem were in very dire economic straits. And when he compared their uh, poverty with some of the people that he had been evangelizing, some of the Christians, he realized that there was a great inequity there. And he purposed in his heart to share the need with, uh, with these. He went back to the, to the area of Ephesus where he had left Priscilla 
in Aquila, or if you want to be proper, I suppose you should say Priscilla and Aquila. And, uh, you know, they had gone uh, from Corinth with him, and they were waiting for him there in Ephesus, which is across the Aegean Sea from, uh, from Corinth. And when he got back to all of, all of his way to Ephesus from Jerusalem, he talked to the churches that he'd founded about this need in Jerusalem. And then when he got to Ephesus, he wrote a number of churches and sent letters to them. He wrote to the church at Philippi, and he wrote to the church of Thessalonica, and he wrote to the church at Corinth. And he told them that he would appreciate it if they would gather and things together for the saints back in Jerusalem. Well, when his letter reached Corinth, the church there was in deep schism, and uh, some of the God's people there in Corinth were very concerned about it, and they didn't know where Paul was until they received his letter. And as soon as they received his letter, now that particular letter is not recorded, it's mentioned but it's not recorded. Uh, and uh, when they received his letter in Corinth, some of them caught the first boat, I suppose, back with the messenger, who was probably Timothy at that time. He sent, uh, they went back with the messenger to Ephesus. And uh, they asked a lot of questions from the congregation in the, the letter of First Corinthians. Is, uh, is in answer to these vi this visit by these who came over across the Aegean Sea to see the Apostle Paul. And one of the things that, uh, that he was told was that uh, there was a schism. And he discusses this schism in, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where he says, I beseech you, Brethren, this is in verse 10, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak, all speak the same thing, and there be no division among you. And then he goes on and he talks more about that. In chapter 3, it says it's a sign of carnality to have these divisions. And then he speaks to the subject of those at Corinth who were judging him, that he just wasn't a proper apostle, and so forth. And he comments about this judging on their part uh, in chapter 4. He says uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, Let a man so account of us as of ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. He says, Now, I've been hearing you've got all kind of appraisals of me. Well, I want you to know that what I do, I do as a minister of Christ and as a steward of the mysteries of God. He speaks in the plural. It's this uh, editorial we, I believe it's called. Verse 2, moreover, it's required in a steward that a man be found faithful. He says, I, I'm a steward, and it's a requirement of a steward that he be found faithful. And he says in verse 3, But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or of any man's judgment, yea, I judge not mine own self. He says, Look, I have already said that I'm a steward, and a steward has a right to expect to be judged. So I'm not complaining about being judged. It's all right for you to judge me, since I have held myself out to be a steward. And it's all right to be bring me into question, but I want to tell you something. It's a very small thing if you judge me, with me. It's really not that big a deal as far as I'm concerned. He says, because I don't even judge my own self. I don't trust myself to be my judge. I, and he's talking about in his daily walk, in his daily activity. 
You know, I almost shudder when I hear Christians say, well, what's wrong with that? I don't have any guilt on that. Uh, my, uh, I'm not uh, condemned about that. Uh, that's not uh, a problem with me. If I, if I was wrong, I'd feel guilty. Well, the Apostle Paul says he doesn't trust his heart along those lines. He says, in verse 4, he says, I know nothing by myself or against myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judges me is the Lord. He says, look, I'm in a position to be judged because I hold out, I profess something. I claim to be something. It's all right with me if you want to judge me. But you're not the judge that I'll stand before. He says, I don't trust your judgment for one thing. I don't even trust my own judgment. He says, I don't know a thing in my life. He says, as I search out with my own heart, as I search my own walk, I can't think of anything that I know of that displeases God in my walk. And he says, that does not justify me. Oh, that we would have some saints that would believe that. That they could look into their own lives and when they see nothing at all that they appraise as displeasing to God, that they would then say, that does not justify me. That's what the Apostle Paul said. He says, I'm not justified because I can find nothing in my walk that I can think of that's displeasing to God. He says, I say, God, you judge me. And the reason he says that is because the Apostle Paul knew that God had said, the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. And Paul's cry was the cry of this... Um, of this song. The psalmist David, when he said, Search me, O God. He says, I need to have my heart searched and I need to have my thoughts searched. Now, this is not the only psalm where, uh, where David brings up that subject. Look back in the 19th psalm. That's the one that we talked about when we're talking about the presumptuous sin, we might just look there. Psalm 19, verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Who, who, who is it that can search out his own errors? The psalmist says. Cleanse thou me from secret faults. See? Uh, David didn't have any misconceptions about his ability to judge his own heart. When, when you are given a commission by God, when you're made a steward of the gospel, when you're made a steward of his word, you're going to be judged and you shouldn't, it shouldn't get you all out of joint that somebody's judging you. One of the reasons that I know I've not arrived yet because it still bothers me when I'm judged by my fellow human being, particularly by my fellow Christian, when he judges my actions in my service to the Lord. It bothers me. I haven't arrived at the point that Paul had arrived at, and he says, <laughs> he says, I know you're judging me, but with me, that's a small thing. Just put that out of your mind. That's not, that's not a big deal with me. Well, I think I have to admit that uh, sometimes I make a big deal out of that when I feel like I'm being falsely judged by my fellow Christians. So uh, we got a ways to go yet. See? But Paul says, he asks God to search him. And the psalmist here says, who can understand his errors? This is Psalm 19:12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sin. 
Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression, which is presumptuous sin. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And what a worthy occupation it is for one who would hold himself out to be a steward to cry upon God daily, search me, O God, especially if he will agree with God that my heart is desperately wicked. My heart is deceitful. Not just a little bit, but my heart is deceitful above all things, and that's why I need to cry out, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. You see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me, lead me in the way everlasting. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have supplied us with everything we need. We thank you that it's even all right to see the blackness of our own heart because you have graciously given us that which makes all as white as snow. For thou hast said, If we will confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you, Lord, that though our sins be as scarlet, they can be white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Blotted out, cast into the depths of the sea. Lord, we thank you that in some marvelous way you have the ability to cast our sins behind your back into the sea of your forgetfulness. What a marvelous provision for which we thank. Therefore, we gladly cry out, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. You, God, see. You all-knowing, omniscient God that thinks upon me. You see if there be any wicked way in me that I might walk in the way everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen.